there is more knowledge here than anywhere else in the galaxy. Only members of the Jedi Council are allowed access. Guarding the holocrons is one of the most important duties a Jedi can be given. Do you think you're up to the task? Star Wars fans to another episode of the Jedi Temple Archives podcast. I'm your host, Rob, and we're recording this episode on Monday, May 20th, 2019. Uh, I'm joined again this week by my friend and co-host Tom Howell from the Hyperion Adventures podcast. And I know, Tom, you guys have got to be counting down the days until the uh, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge opens out there in Disneyland. (laughs) Days, hours, minutes, uh, it's coming so close now. It's hard to believe when they announced this, uh, whatever it was, four years ago. Uh, now it's right on our doorstep. It's amazing. We're so excited. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. Hopefully you can uh, come on and share some of the details after you've had a chance to experience it. And uh, I'm counting down the days. I mean, we're not going to get out there to see it until September and then uh, probably down at Walt Disney World in December. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing the land. And now they've kind of got some news about the Star Wars themed hotel at Walt Disney World going vertical. So that's on its way. I think they're looking at a 2020 uh, opening date Mm -hmm. for that hotel if it stays on track. So a lot of exciting Star Wars news within the Disney parks. I've said it many times recently. It's a great time to be alive as a Star Wars fan, for sure. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure we don't even know all the details about what's going to be offered. You know, there's certainly a lot of information out there, but I'm sure they're going to expand on those offerings as time goes on yeah no question we'll find out a lot more as we get through the summer i'm sure the d23 expo this year there's going to be some info on uh, some of these star wars offerings at the parks and of course uh, some of the films and television shows as well yeah and I, we've got some news on that later on in the show so we'll nice. uh, we'll hold off on that until the holonet news portion but for right now we're going to go ahead and jump into our main topic of the week And this was actually a suggestion from one of our listeners who wanted to know a little bit more about Chewbacca and the Wookiees really overall as a species. Um, So as far as the Wookiees go, and and really Chewbacca as well, they are dealt with to some degree within uh, the films a little bit more deeply uh, in some of the spinoffs like The Clone Wars. Uh, But really, there's not a ton known about both the Wookiees as a species and Chewbacca specifically. Um, the Wookiees, uh, were actually an inspiration for George Lucas, uh, his dog, Indiana, who gets mentioned in the, uh, Indiana Jones films was actually his motivation or his inspiration for creation of the Wookiees species. If you hear Mark Hamill talk about them, uh, and a lot of his speaking engagements, he refers to the Wookiees as kind of being like the family dog. I think we actually had some clips in the Peter Mayhew tribute that you put together, Tom, talking about that. And actually, interesting little fact about the Wookiees is that the the word Wookiee actually came from Lucas's first film, which was THX 1138. One of the robotic cops in that particular film uh, said, I think I just hit a Wookiee. And that's where the origin of the the name Wookiee came from. I I believe that line was even ad-libbed. It was just a random line that they just kind of threw in. It wasn't in the script at all. And uh, now it's become this great piece of canon within the Star Wars universe. It's amazing. Yeah, and certainly uh, certainly a huge part of the Star Wars films, for sure. Mm-hmm. The Wookiees, as a species, uh, come from the planet of Kashyyyk, which is in the mid-rim. And it's a pretty much a forest-type planet, uh, forest and jungle. Um, the deep jungles, the trees are hundreds of feet tall. Uh, the primary language spoken by the Wookiees is a language called Shriwook, and uh, they can learn to understand other languages, but they can't actually speak them themselves. So that's why you see, you know, Chewbacca always seems to understand what everyone around him is saying, as do a lot of the other Wookiees. But, you know, when they speak, it's it's just the growls and grunts of their uh, their home language. Yeah, some sort of a physical issue with their, their vocal cords and uh, the way they speak. They just won't allow them to actually speak these other languages, even though, like you said, they understand them very well. 
Yeah, and they're generally considered to be highly intelligent, um, certainly a sentient species. Uh, you know, Chewbacca. Well, don't tell his, the Empire that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we'll get into that in a little bit because certainly it was convenient for the Empire to uh, ignore that for their own purposes later on. Um, but I think generally it's well known that the Wookiees are very tall. They tend to range from about seven to nine feet. They're incredibly strong. Uh, and it, one thing that may not be known is that they do possess claws, but they have a code of honor that only allows them to use those for climbing. Um, although Chewbacca apparently violated that honor code within The Force Awakens, he actually used his claws on one of the First Order Stormtroopers. Yeah, I just read that a little bit ago myself. I had no idea that that had happened, but he kind of reconciled it by the fact like, look, they have no honor, so why should I honor the code with them? So, you know, but it'd be interesting. I didn't see that taking actual place uh within the film itself but uh interesting that that has come uh out as a note yeah i think it was actually from the young adult novelization mm. so i hadn't seen it until i was doing a little bit of research for this particular episode mm -hmm. uh, more just to validate a lot of the things that i already knew mm -hmm. um but you know as we talked about they're definitely a very loyal and intelligent species uh they hold dear the idea of a life debt as well as something that they call an honor family which is kind of an extension uh, of that life Life debt, And so a good example would be Chewbacca had a life debt to Han Solo mm -hmm. uh, as a result of Han saving him from, um, you know, the Imperials on Mimban in the movie Solo. But uh, the honor family concept is a way of extending that to other people. And Wookiees would do this kind of intertribally on their own planet. But in the, in the case of Chewbacca, he extended that uh, honor family not only to Han Solo, but to Princess Leia and Luke and even the droids. So... Uh, he was very protective of them, and, and they were held in high regard by Chewbacca. Yeah, I mean, really, and, and when you watch the films, and I'm sure we'll discuss this much more as we go on through Chewbacca, but he was uh, such the heart and soul of these movies, and you, you could see it, how much he loved this. Yes, they weren't his true family, but they really, um, yes, through this honor family, uh, became his family. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, this is another... Another place, I, we're going to do a later episode on the droids uh, of the Star Wars universe and some details about them. But one of the really unique things about Star Wars is that they do a really good job of attributing emotions and allowing the viewer to actually feel like they understand what the droid is saying or what mm -hmm. a Wookiee or, you know, some some creature that's not speaking a language that you can understand. You still feel like you're understanding what they're saying. Uh, and, you know, that that is one of the really cool things about Star Wars, as far as I'm concerned, is, is just you feel like you know these creatures um, and what they're saying, even though you can't understand a word that's coming out of their mouth. Yeah, the emotions of just some simple beeps out of R2-D2 or uh, BB-8 or just a... Uh, a shake of the head or a shrug of the shoulder, you know, from Chewbacca, and you just kind of know what he's thinking at that time, or a little chuckle. Uh, you you know exactly where he, where his mind is. Yeah, and so in the scope of the films, you know, we see the Wookiees uh, kind of taking part in the Clone Wars, uh, specifically some battles against the Separatists, and the most uh, probably well known of those was uh, the Battle of Kashyyyk that was fought there at kind of the middle to the end of Revenge of the Sith. And they were very loyal to the Galactic Republic and, and later to the Rebellion and the New Republic after the, um, you know, the rebels defeated the Empire. But to the great sorrow of the, Wookie, uh, the Wookiees as a species, when the Empire rose, uh, as Tom alluded to earlier, they it wasn't so much they felt the Wookiees were a threat, but the Wookiees were so strong and able to uh, stand up so well to these very harsh environments that the Empire decided it was going to be convenient for them to use them as slaves. Uh, and they actually ended up declaring them a non-sentient species. Uh, and then that allowed them to kind of justify enslaving the Wookiees, which they then turned around and made them into basically laborers for a lot of their projects, including the creation of the Death Star. Um, some were sent to the Spice Mines of Kessel to work there, which we saw in Solo, A Star Wars Story. And um, this continued on basically through the entire reign of the Empire. Chewbacca was one of the, the lucky few that uh, escaped from that life. Yeah, uh, and, but he was trapped within that life in many regards until Solo freed him. Uh, just such a terrible thing to happen to any species out there but yes they were just so durable and so strong and like you you just alluded to uh, able to uh you know get through so many different 
difficult elements that over uh, humanoids or uh, many of the other alien uh, species that were out there that the, the Empire just realized that we can put them to work for so many hours and we don't have to pay them because we'll enslave them and uh, they're going to get all this work done for us. And it's just it's just a, a heartbreaking story, really. Yeah. And they weren't you know, they weren't opposed to working them to their death, really, mm -hmm, really. So uh, in terms of how they were able to control the Wookiees, I mean, obviously you're dealing with a very fierce species here and an incredibly strong species. They actually, the Empire had actually uh, installed inhibitor chips within the Wookiees that they could use to basically create, you know, very, very painful uh, sensations in their body. And then they also determined that the easiest way to control them was not so much threats of pain for them individually, but, you know, in, uh, inflicting pain on other members of their family or their clan, uh, which was typically the approach that they used to really kind of get leverage with these Wookiees and force them to do their bidding. Yeah, I mean, we just talked about it a little bit ago how much, uh, say, Chewbacca uh, had, you know, with the, the uh, Honor family, uh, you know, but if you had your real actual Wookiee family there, uh, you know, it's one thing to take the pain on yourself, uh, but to see that pain inflicted on someone you love or, uh, or a really good friend or whatever the case may be, that hurt them more than the actual receiving of the pain they get even through these uh, inhibitor chips that they re received. So uh, it was, you know, it was terrible, but... Uh, I, I guess, a wise plan by the Empire to kind of control these creatures. You could really see that with Chewbacca, even though you didn't see him so much interacting with other Wookiees. You saw how protective he was of Han Solo and Princess Leia and uh, basically those he considered to be part of his honor family. So it was definitely uh, an effective strategy that the Empire uh, employed to kind of control the Wookiees. Now, when we start talking specifically about Chewbacca, who is certainly going to be the Wookiee that most people are familiar with, um, you know, it's really interesting that he was such a major character in the films, and yet there's really very little information given within the context of the films in terms of his background. I know a lot of people wonder if he was married. Did he have children? Um, you know, how could he go for so long without seeing his family if, if he did, in fact, have one? But when you take and consider the fact that, you know, Wookiees tend to live on average maybe 400 years. And I think at the time of the solo film, he was, uh, what, 189? He was, I think that's what he said. And then I have to look yeah. back at the film again, which we'll be watching soon, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was somewhere around. I know it was over 150 for sure. Right, right. So, you know, the long lifespan of the Wookiees may, and, and the close family ties that they had would really enable them to go, you know, potentially decades without seeing family, which is what allowed Chewbacca to to um, fulfill his life debt to Han Solo. And interestingly enough, I mean, you look at that, you know, his life debt to Han Solo would have been complete on, on the death of Han Solo, but Chewbacca, you know, was so loyal to him that he sticks around even past that. Right. It's, you know, I mean, he just is so tied and, you know, you know, Leia is still alive, General Leia. And I think that, you know, he's seen some things with, uh, with Ray and with, uh, with Finn, even that he's kind of, uh, attaching himself to R2 is still around, of course, and he's part of that honor family as well. Uh, there's so much still part of there. Yes, uh, Han is not around, but that doesn't mean that the honor family still doesn't exist. Exactly. Uh, in regards to Chewbacca and, and his family, he did actually have a wife, um, and her name was Mala Dabak, uh, otherwise known as Mala for short. Uh, and then he also had a son named Lumpawaru, uh, <laughs> who, yeah, again, every every Wookiee name is a mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, he typically went by the shortened name of either Lumpy or Waru. So, uh, Why did you get this information? I don't remember anything in regards to this information. Was there a certain television show that came on in the 70s that had uh, this i don't I, recall i something about a christmas special <laughs> <laughs> yes if you don't know if you haven't seen the star wars holiday special you, you meet chewbacca's family within the the star wars holiday special and by the way you can find that uh, I, I think it's still out on, on youtube in some places you can find it online it's something to watch i'll say that yeah, I'm mean, actually that that makes me think maybe I need to get a line of uh, I survived the Star Wars Christmas special T-shirts <laughs> out there. <laughs> so that, it that, would yeah, that actually is worthy as a worthy T-shirt for sure. It may very well be that that was a component of the Jedi trials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had to make it through the Christmas special. Yeah, perfect. Yep. So I would encourage uh, people, if if you really want to see what Star Wars shouldn't be, uh, go <laughs> check out the Christmas special. Uh, I know Tom and I both tried to rewatch it and, and we're both unsuccessful. 
But interestingly enough, uh, as far as Chewbacca goes, you know, we've talked about Ahsoka Tano in the past on this show. He actually did um, meet and interact with Ahsoka Tano uh, during a period during the Clone Wars where both of them had been captured by Trandoshan. They weren't slavers, but uh, Trandoshans uh, who took them back to a moon near their home planet and would release them and, and, you know, hunt them down for sport. And if you're kind of curious who the Trandoshans are, um, Bosk is mm-hmm. probably the one most people are going to be familiar with. You see him in that scene uh, in Empire Strikes Back on the Star Destroyer when Vader gets together the bounty hunters to track down Han Solo. Um, kind of lizard-looking so uh, aliens, uh, yeah, creatures. Yep. So, yeah, yep, definitely a large lizard-type uh, creatures, kind of a yellowish-orange mm-hmm. scaly skin. Um, but anyway, uh, Ahsoka and Chewbacca had worked together in this particular scenario to uh, kind of defeat their captors and escape with a number of other uh, people who had been captured and were being hunted for sport. So um, there's an interesting tie in there between Chewbacca and Ahsoka. I know that there are some storylines and I believe this is again in some of the young adult books, but uh, Chewbacca does have uh, some interaction with uh, K2SO and Mm -hmm. Cassie and Andor um, during one of those adventures. And this was kind of earlier, you know, obviously this is uh, pre-Episode 4 and certainly pre-Rogue 1 when Cassian and and K2SO were a little bit more mercenary and uh, doing things on behalf of the Rebellion. So he has some interesting uh, interactions with characters that didn't really show up until much later. Uh, And then as well, you know, he he met Han Solo on the planet of Memban, uh, which we see there in uh, Solo, a Star Wars story. Uh, where he's being held captive and Han Solo gets thrown down in this pit with the expectation, you know, the soldiers who threw him down there were like, oh, this will be great. He's going to tear him limb from limb. He's going to, you know, do our work for us, essentially. But fortunately for Han Solo, he knew Shri Wook uh, and was able to kind of formulate a plan with Han Solo for the two of them to escape. And then they went on to engage with uh, Beckett and and his crew. Uh, And that's really how they come across Lando Calrissian and and, uh, pick up the Millennium Falcon as well. So yeah, a little, just a little depth into that story. I mean, if you haven't seen Solo, a Star Wars story yet, uh, you're, I, I know there was a little bit of a, you know, a boycott of it almost, or just kind of a, a poo-pooing of it, if for lack of a better word, of this film. Uh, maybe it just came out at a bad time, but it, uh, while I wouldn't say that it is one of the great Star Wars films, it is a lot of fun and it does uh, open up a, a, a large world of, uh, you know, of Han Solo in the early years and uh, Chewbacca and how they got together and uh, some of the early adventures they've had. And I, I highly recommend it. it you know, I mean, don't if you if you don't go into it looking for this huge, weighty Star Wars movie that's going to provide you a lot of depth in how the Rebellion defeated the Empire or how the Empire took control of the universe or or whatever, um, you just go in there and just look for a, a, some summer fun. It's it's a good film. Yeah, and the interesting thing about it is that really any actor that has to come in and play an iconic character mm-hmm. like Han Solo, even a young Han Solo, is really being put in an impossible position. I mean, uh, you know, Harrison Ford and the way he owned that role within the Star Wars films it was so amazing, and he created you know just this iconic character out of it, and. I was actually pretty surprised. I thought that Elden Einreich uh, did a really good job. Mm-hmm. Um, you could you could tell he was a little less comfortable with it early in the film, but he kind of gets into that uh, kind of cocky, brash, Han Solo type attitude, and and he pulled it off uh, better than I think anyone could have expected him to. Uh, and Donald Glover, you know, as Lando Calrissian, I thought he was a little more oily than uh, you know Billy D. Williams' portrayal, but still, I mean. You felt like that was, you know, a Lando Calrissian that you could buy into, maybe a little bit more brash and, you know, the cockiness of youth, I guess. Yeah, he's Um, a younger version of him. And, you know, he hasn't maybe learned the lessons that obviously he learns some lessons within this film itself. But more as his life, uh, you know, extends. Uh, and uh, so, we, you know, what we meet in uh, The Empire Strikes Back is kind of an older, wiser Lando Calrissian, although he still has some struggles trying to figure a few things out and, you know, what's best for himself and for his people and stuff. Uh, but 
Um, I, I only wish actually there was more Lando in that film. Uh, I thought that he was in a very interesting character and he could have been uh, really great. Um, I think that Ron Howard coming into that film uh, and taking over and, um, you know, really the one thing with Ron Howard does really well is work with actors. Really, be, you know, being a former actor for so many years himself, he really speaks their language. He really works with actors. And I, you know, I don't know for sure this, but um, I give him a lot of credit for what at the end ended up being the portrayal of Solo when, um, yes, did he exactly look like him? Did he exactly pull off Han? Maybe not, but there was a lot of the mannerisms, a lot of the sly little looks, a little, you know, half smiles. And um, it, it, it really, as I've watched it more, I, I, he pulled it off to me for sure. Yeah, I definitely think it's a it's a Star Wars movie worth watching. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I had no idea prior to that film that you could actually have your starship get booted. So that was uh, that <laughs> was pretty right. entertaining as well. Yes. So. <laughs> Watch out for those traffic cops; they'll, they'll get you. Yep. So, uh, and again, you know, another film where Chewbacca and his uh, wicked Wookiee strength played into mm -hmm. into the plot of that movie pretty mm -hmm. pretty well as well. So. Uh, the other kind of defining characteristic of Chewie is his bowcaster, which is his primary weapon of choice. And I know that, you know, they, they kind of make some uh, fun reference to it in Force Awakens when Han Solo asks if he can borrow it and, mm -hmm. you know, fires it. And he's like, oh, I like this. Yeah, so, it's pretty good. But that that actual weapon, um, it, it is actually a, a handcrafted bowcaster. Chewbacca's is actually made out of some components from a Stormtrooper uh, E11 blaster rifle. And the interesting thing about the bowcaster is it fires uh, metal quarrels that are basically uh, encased in plasma energy. And it uses magnetic acceleration to launch them incredibly fast and incredibly accurately. And that's, again, what made it so much more powerful than a standard blaster. So uh, there was some mention that one of the reasons the Wookiees were the only ones you would see using bowcasters is because they were supposed to be incredibly heavy weapons and most humans wouldn't even be able to lift them up, much less fire them. Uh, I think that you know, kind of got brought into question with the force awakens, but mm -hmm. uh, you definitely have to admit that, you know, it was, it was a powerful weapon and uh, it was certainly an iconic trademark of Chewbacca. And he was very accurate with it. There's no question about that. He was able to pick off a lot of stormtroopers throughout the many of their escapades. And uh, Chewie is one of the best. Yeah. Um, any other, you know, in world facts that you think that we should bring to light about Chewbacca, Tom? Uh, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I as far as in world, I, I just every time you see Chewbacca, and I talked about this just a little bit ago. You know, he is just the heart of this this film. He is, I, I yes, he's the family dog who can talk back with you, as Mark Hamill would would say. Yes, yeah, you know, he is. But I mean, he just you could just feel his love for his friends and his family, his honor family. I mean. When he finds C-3PO torn apart on, in, on Bespin and goes in there and fights off to save all his parts and try and, you know, get them back together. And you just feel it like he's like, what are you doing? No, this is my friend. You know, you can't do this. Um, and you, you see it so often. And just like you said, you know, the the, the subtle work of uh, just, uh, you know, a, a little chuckle or a shrug or a lift of an eyelid as much as you could with the Chewbacca mask or a shake of the head. And you just knew what he was feeling every time. And he just expressed such emotion. And Peter Mayhew, who, you know, obviously was Chewbacca for most of the films, uh, deserves so much credit for pulling that off. Um, it, it's just amazing to see that, you know, you were able to make this creature, uh, this uh, being work the way it did and to be such a beloved character within the Star Wars universe. Yeah, clearly that's what turned Maz Kanata onto him. I know <laughs> she has right. some pretty that's, strong that's feelings right. about Chewbacca, right? <laughs> I love that Wookiee. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and you mentioned uh, Peter Mayhew. You know, one of the other things, I'm almost certain that one of the reasons this came up as a topic for the show is I think that, you know, with his passing, uh, just having happened here within the last couple of weeks, um, but he's still fairly prevalently on a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, again, it's just one of those things where he it wasn't just that Chewbacca as a character was was such a great character, but that was because of the performance that uh, was put forth by Peter Mayhew uh, and, you know, Jonas uh, Suotamo, who mm -hmm. is, you know, now playing Chewbacca within the Star Wars films. 
uh, worked a lot with Peter Mayhew just to make sure that he was being true to the mannerisms and, you know, the, uh, the way that that character was portrayed in the films. And that's another great thing, um, that there's so much respect and really wanting to carry that on. Uh, I know that Tom had provided some clips as part of his montage that he gave us last week to play. And I do want to play one here real quick. Uh, this is uh, in regards to Peter Mayhew and how he initially got the role of Chewbacca. Door opened and George walked in with Gary behind him. So naturally, what did I do? I'm raised in England. As soon as someone comes in through the door, I stand up. George goes, hmm, virtually turned to Gary and said, I think we found him. So as you can see there, I mean, clearly he didn't have to say a word to George Lucas. I mean, George came in and it's not really spoken, but I think the height certainly mm-hmm. played a huge factor in him getting the role. But I almost have to believe that, you know, there was something about his presence or his personality that just conveyed, you know, the right feel to George Lucas, uh, you know, as he walked into that room. Right. I got to believe that, too. I mean, I, every time you saw him and I uh, unfortunately never during his lifetime got to meet or be in the same room as Peter Mayhew. But from every uh, encounter you hear about from him, that he was just warm and loving and loved Star Wars fans, loved Star Wars, was was everything that Chewbacca was really in, in real life. I mean, yes, he wasn't the big warriors, per se, that Chewbacca could be when he was provoked and needed to be but the 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 loving side of him the the heartwarming side of him um i i really believe that was peter mayhew coming through the giant costume that he had to wear yeah i i think that's absolutely the case and unfortunately kind of as time went on and you know the the original trilogy was all shot within about a what a six or seven year uh, Mm -hmm. span Um, and then they had a a very large gap of time before they got to the prequel uh, trilogy and by the even by that point uh, you know Peter Mayhew was having some medical issues he'd always had some knee issues I know he had spoken a number of times just about the process of getting into the the co-pilot's seat on the Falcon was incredibly painful for Mm -hmm. him Um, You know, and I can certainly commiserate with that. But uh, the thing about Peter Mayhew, one of the things I love about him is he's the reason if you go on the TSA website and do a search on lightsaber, uh, they actually address that on the TSA website. (laughs) Uh, And that was in large part due to the fact that he had a cane uh, that he would use for assistance in walking. Uh, That was a lightsaber for all intents and purposes. And he had a bit of a run in with TSA where they wanted to confiscate that. Um, And he went out on social media and and they initially, uh, you know, kind of held their ground. But then they pretty quickly uh, backpedaled on that. And now they address it, you know, as as uh, a specific item that you can or cannot bring on a flight. So, uh, you know, he was he was helping the little guy even when he wasn't in costume. Yeah. Who would have thought that would have been one of his biggest legacies is the fact that, you know, if you're going to your n- next convention, D23 Expo, Star Wars Celebration, whatever, you can bring your lightsaber on to that plane. Thanks to Peter Mayhew. Exactly. So uh, and then the other thing I want to point out with uh, with Chewbacca and really the Wookiees in general is that um, when Ben Burt, who was the sound designer for the Star Wars films, uh, was trying to put together uh, a Chewbacca um, sound, the the speech and everything, he actually had recorded a number of different animals and kind of mixed them together depending on what type of emotion he was trying to portray. So I think, uh, you know, bears were clearly mm-hmm. uh, one of the one of the more prominent ones. But uh, he also had recorded sounds from badgers, lions, seals and even a walrus that he used to convey all the different types of emotion that Chewbacca was feeling. And I think it goes without saying that Ben Burt uh, did an, an incredible job with the sound design for all the Star Wars films. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, they, they just wouldn't be the world that you you know without those the, all the sounds that they collected and created um, through various different aspects of, of, of finding these things. And it, it's it, and sometimes if you go and watch some of these uh, behind the scenes uh, or, you know, whatever add ons extras to some of these uh, Blu-rays, discs, whatever, however you are watching these films, it's, it's amazing to see how they collect it. And you, you, you chuckle sometimes. And like that was how that was made. That's incredible. It's 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 so good. 
Yeah. And I mean, just it was genius. I mean, uh, when we talk about the fact that droids and and some of these creatures that don't speak galactic basic, I guess you call it uh, within the Star Wars universe, that you feel like you can understand them. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the sound design was done in such a way that it conveyed all those emotions without you understanding a word of what was coming out of their mouth. And it's one of those things we talked about a little bit. You were on our show yesterday and we we broke down, we did our Star Wars Remembered series and we were talking about uh, Revenge of the Sith. And, you know, how the uh, the tone was set so much by John Williams. And you mentioned the fact that George Lucas did a lot of that tone setting as well, kind of cueing uh, John Williams. And this is how we want the sound to be during this part of the score um, that all that tied together. You know, they, yes, it was the special effects. Yes, it was uh, the actors. Uh, yes, it was the unique worlds you're a visit. But it's also just the little things that you don't notice the sounds, uh, the score. And, you know, there's just so many different things that make these films so great and resonate with so many people. Yeah, and I mean, that's those are the things that even when one facet of one of the films may be falling down in a particular area, mm-hmm. the, the other components are still so good that it kind of picks it up and it, and it uh, you know, maybe saves a scene that might have otherwise been really, really awkward. So um, not that that's an issue that they generally need a lot of help with. So No, but uh, I completely <laughs> agree with you. And I still think you need to you need to rename the series Star Wars Dismembered. Um, <laughs> I like that. I like that es- tweet, by the way. <laughs> especially in uh, in relation to Episode Three. So um, that'll pretty much do it, I think, for uh, our portion of the show on the Wookiees and Chewbacca in particular. Um, any other any other last th- uh, last minute thoughts before we leave that? No, I think we pretty much covered it. Uh, you know, like I said, I just when you watch those films and y- you just love Chewbacca to death. He's he's one of your favorite characters, and he never says a real word that you understand you you know he has to speak through everybody else yet the ability to pull this off and, and be such a beloved character i don't know anybody who doesn't love chewbacca and in um even though we don't know much about the wookies uh doesn't don't love the wookies by extension um and I, I, you look at it and you wonder about what the future is with some of these television shows and future movies that come out and you look and yes was chewbacca in solo a star wars story 189 or whatever it is and we don't know much about his past it would be a great region to delve into with uh, the films or television series or whatever to find out what got Chewbacca to this point where he meets Han Solo and meets all these other characters. We see little instances of his life, but I've, there's got to be such a, a depth of story out there to uncover. Yeah, and actually that dovetails really well right into one of our Holland at News stories. It, it, would you be willing to stay on for the for the news portion? Because there are a couple things on here I'd be interested to get your take on. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, you know, specifically as it relates to other potential topics for them to to explore in the live action series that are going to be coming to Disney plus streaming service. Uh, It was brought up this week um, by Disney that in addition to both the Mandalorian and the as yet untitled Cassie and Andor series that Disney plus is going to be carrying uh, later this year and into 2020, uh, that there's also a third uh, live action series that they're working Mm -hmm. uh, on that's related to star Wars. I have not been able to find any uh, details on what that may be, and it may not have been released yet, but um, kind of to your point, I mean, there is so much that they can explore, so many backstories that they could go into or so many, you know, stories downstream that there's the huge gap between uh, Return of the Jedi and uh, Force Awakens that they can explore mm-hmm. with certain characters. So um, it'll be very interesting to see what they come out with uh, in regards to that third live action series. I, I think the the options are just so wide that it could be a lot of different things. It could be something in regards to characters we know. It could be something completely different characters that we're going to learn of. Uh, I don't know. I think most of this came out in a, there was a uh, uh, Bob Iger statement that he did uh, recently this week that a lot of, some, a lot of the Star Wars news that we heard this week uh, came out. And that was one of the things that he alluded to, that there will be a third Uh, Disney Plus series. Uh, We don't know when that's going to arrive. Uh, Obviously, we know The Mandalorian was going to be uh, there when Disney Plus launches in November. I believe that they're going to start filming the Cassian Andor series somewhere around the early fall of this year, late summer, early fall is when they're going to start filming that. Makes sense that that might be the next one that is released right after the Mandalorian kind of wraps up and then maybe they have another series set to go after that to kind of, you know, just kind of keep the flow going, keep the momentum going for Disney plus and, and keep those star Wars fans um, who are designing all this extra 
uh, stuff that's out there in the world to, to keep it going. And, and I'm looking forward to it all. I am as well. And uh, just to kind of uh, mention something or, or let everyone put a pin in something here, in regards to The Mandalorian, uh, it was discussed at Star Wars Celebration that they brought in some members of the 501st mm-hmm. uh, to portray some of the stormtroopers that they needed for some of the scenes they were shooting for that particular show. And I was able to actually reach out to one of the guys who uh, who was with the 501st, who was on on set and uh, take you know taking part in the filming of the Mandalorian, and he uh, offered to come on our show uh, once the first season has aired and their non disclosure agreement is you know uh, mm-hmm. is uh, fulfilled. He's going to come on and he's going to talk a little bit about that experience. So um, that's probably going to be you know probably spring, uh, maybe even summer 2020, but. Uh, we do have that on on uh, tab for later on in the show. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm going to be really interested to hear uh, what that whole experience was like. Um, I know John Favreau seems to be a pretty, pretty nice guy. Um, and Filoni is, you know, definitely a character. So yeah. uh, between the two of them, uh, you know, and as well, you know, it's, it looks like a really awesome show uh like a lot of the actors that they're that they're going to have portraying some of the characters within that so i think it's going to be really cool to hear that experience yeah i i I agree with you even just to hear about the 501st for those of you who don't know anything about the 501st they're such a great group and just to hear uh you know him have him discuss uh more of what they do uh, how they've came about and yeah, but of course, obviously you want to hear about this fantastic thing that happened to them where they were lucky enough. They didn't even know they were going to be doing this. They thought they were going to some sort of charity event or whatever the case may be. And then they find out that they're, no, you're actually going to be in the series. It's, it's got to be an amazing story for, and I look forward to hearing him tell it. Yeah. And I actually am in the works as well to, to talk to some uh, members that uh, run a couple of the different garrisons of the 501st. And kind of get some of that information mm-hmm. about who they are as an organization, what they do, and how people can can uh, contact them if they want to engage them for an event. So uh, more details to, to come later on about that as well. Look forward to that. Yep. Uh, so the other kind of big uh, Star Wars entertainment news that came out, and this came out, uh, I believe it was last weekend. We we already filmed the show uh, a little bit early for Mother's Day, but uh, Lucasfilm, uh, Disney specifically, had announced their long-term film plans. And one of the things that they uh, discussed was the fact that starting in Christmas of 2022 – uh, and then going every other year through 2026, their plan is to release uh, new Star Wars films basically every other year during that period. And these films are going to be uh, directed by D.B. Weiss and David Benoff, um, who are the directors uh, for the Game of Thrones series. So if you've watched Game of Thrones, if you like Game of Thrones, um, it looks like what they're going to be focusing on is probably an Old Republic storyline. We So that... That yeah. we haven't got the details on it yet. We don't really know. I mean, we may find out more this year, the D23 Expo or Comic Con, um, but n- not sure. It may be too far off for that to happen. Maybe possibly more at uh, Star Wars Celebration 2020 in Anaheim. That might be more of a, uh, a reasonable idea. Um, Bob Iger didn't actually say that the, those two would be uh, doing all three films. He did say the first film that's in 2022 they are doing, but right. I, I haven't. Uh, he hasn't tabbed them necessarily to do the other two, although you kind of wonder if, if they're bringing them on board, it makes sense that this is going to be their trilogy, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Yeah, and I know they've had some issues with, uh, you know, finding directors that mm-hmm. they that they work well with. Um, so hopefully this works out for them. Uh, again, when I when I mentioned the Old Republic, it's just purely speculation at this point, but that seems to be the most popular theory about what these are going to be about. I, I would be all for that. I think, sure. it's, you know, it's a period of time when the Jedi and the Sith were both kind of at the height of their um, you know, ascendancy, and there's a lot of conflict between the two. So there's all kinds of stories they could tell there. Um, and for any of the fans of the old, you know, the old Republic video game, I think, you know, that would be a, a neat tie in for that as well. That'd be very exciting. I, I would look forward to hearing more stories about the old Republic for sure. But I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if we turn Star Wars. I mean, yes, for so long, Star Wars has been, you know, Jedi, Sith, the Force. Um, I enjoy some of the films and some of the shows where they're, you know, a Jedi or a Force wielder um, is not necessarily the main focus of it. Maybe they make appearances. Maybe they just kind of are there, but they're 
Um, I don't think it necessarily needs to be based on that. I just love this universe, and it just excites me to hear more stories. It's it's such a, a, a immense universe. If you look at the map of it, there are so many stories to be told over so many thousands of years uh, that I'm excited for. I you know I just like new Star Wars content, no matter how it comes out, and no matter what it it, it discusses. Yeah, I I think that's absolutely the fact uh, the the case, and you know Rogue One is probably the purest example of that. Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, there's there's certainly some allusion to the Jedi and some mysticism surrounding the the Guardians of the Wills, but um, you know there's no other than a, a cameo there at the end by Darth Vader. There is no real Force wielder per se that uh, features prominently in that film, and it was incredibly successful. So they can definitely carry a story without that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at, if you're watching any of the animated shows, Star Wars Resistance, which is I uh, just wrapped up its uh, first season a, a month, a month and a half ago, whatever it was. Uh, the, n- no Jedi involved, no Force wielders involved in that, yet still uh, a very interesting storyline. Absolutely. Uh, the other news, uh, news story that we had for this week was, as I mentioned earlier, the Star Wars Hotel uh, construction at Walt Disney World has gone vertical. Um, for those of you who are familiar with this particular project, I know that's probably a, a constant source of excitement and wanting as much news as you can get about that. For those of you who are maybe less familiar with it, uh, this is going to be kind of a small boutique hotel. I think right now they're estimating that between the – they're calling them cabins and then uh, you know some larger suites within this hotel. They're guesstimating that it could be as few as 68 rooms, I think. Yeah, that's what we've heard some uh, possibilities from some of the sites out there. There's been no official information released yet, but there Correct. people who are digging into some um, some records they've uh, accumulated that uh, kind of uh, look that way, but there's no known, at least to us, uh, exactly how many rooms there will be. But it does seem like it's going to be very small, yes. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, there's there's very little um, concrete information that's come out about this hotel. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about is just going to be, uh, you know, based on best best information we have at this point. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, it's kind of fun to to speculate a little bit on what we think is going to be the sure. likely situation with this hotel. So. Uh, you know, one of the other things that they've mentioned about it is that uh, their expectation at this point, at least, is that it's going to be very similar to a cruise in terms of, um, you know, you're going to have a, a couple of day window potentially where you're you're booking your stay in this hotel. Uh, and then as you check in, you get assigned your persona that is who you're going to be you know, play acting as if you're into the role playing or the cosplay type mm-hmm. uh, approach to things. I'll be very interested to see how they work that into what, you know, whether they're going to make that convenient for people who maybe aren't that into the the cosplay or the role playing side of the stay. And they're just really there for the experience and, you know, maybe some uh, potentially some access to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge above and beyond what normal guests are going to get. I imagine there'll be some sort of opt in, opt out on certain aspects of it uh, would be my expectation. Uh, you know, just like you can what they've talked about in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is that there's a lot of stuff that, yes, if you want to be fully immersed and if you want, you know, some of the once you finish um, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, if you want your score to be uh, calculated and for some of the uh, the different people that are in and around uh, Black Spire Outpost to communicate with you on that, you have that ability. But you, from what I understand, you also have the ability to possibly opt out of that situation. So, you know, you can just kind of do your thing and just go and enjoy it. So it's all on how much you want to do. And it wouldn't surprise me, especially because this is probably going to be a, at a high price location. And so they're going to want people to be as comfortable as possible and, and do what they want to do and and not what they don't have to be doing what they don't necessarily want to do. So I, I expect opt in, opt out options are going to be out there regularly. Yeah, I still yeah, I agree with that. I, I still think that most people who are going to be willing to pay what are likely oh, yeah. going to be some pretty lofty prices to stay here, they're they're doing that uh, so either they or some portion of their family can really have that immersive experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just hoping, you know, they they've talked about the fact that all the windows in this particular hotel are actually going to be, you know, displays that are showing uh, views out into space. Mm-hmm. So let's hope there's no IT glitches. That's going to be. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Disney's not known for IT glitches, are they? Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to go into anything that may or may not have happened on their website today, but <laughs> <Boy>. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um hopefully they get that all nailed down, but uh, maybe uh, you know, even if they have some sort of shutters that they get uh, hey, we we've got something that's gone on, we need to shut the the blast doors for a moment because uh, you know until we correct this uh, spatial issue i don't know uh, but i i wouldn't be surprised if that's exactly what yeah. they do um you know wonder attack you know blast shields down yeah <laughs> it's gonna be interesting i i'm excited about it and uh, we're already saving our money for it because we know it's gonna only be a cost pretty much our whole bank account but uh we're we're excited to experience it at some point yeah, I know as well that uh, at some point here in the past year, I, I want to say it was maybe like six months ago, uh, maybe even as much as nine months ago, but there were some um, there was some discussion online about the fact that Disney had filed some patents for mm-hmm. uh, you know view screens within their vehicles, uh, something similar to, mm-hmm. and I think we've mentioned this on this show before, the Hogwarts Express that they have over at Universal, where it looks like a window, but outside you're actually seeing you know Haggard flying on his flying motorbike right. or. So it seems to me like that would be the perfect place to use that where, you know, when it's time to take the transport from the ship down to Galaxy's Edge, you board through an airlock onto a quote unquote shuttle craft, which is, you know, one of these buses and they take you over and deposit you at Galaxy's Edge. And, it you know, for you on on board that particular shuttle, it looks like you're descending out of orbit into, uh, you know, the atmosphere of the planet Batu and being dropped off at Galaxy's Edge. So I think that would be a really cool um, way of approaching that, that, you know, time will tell if that actually turns out to be the case. But I, I definitely think they have endless opportunities to just make this so ultra immersive that there's really nothing that can match it. Yeah, it, it seems like it's going to be incredible. And yeah, I, I believe that they're going to try and carry the storyline as much as possible throughout it. And we haven't even received more details on what the stays might be like. Do you need three days, four days to complete it? Can you go for an extended run and do a seven days or something kind of like you were talking about the cruise style? Uh, type situation, but it's going to be uh, interesting, however it turns out. And I, I really am convinced that this is going to be one of the key things we find out at the D23 Expo coming up this August in Anaheim. Yeah. And for those seven day stays, are you going to be able to do the second mortgage for your house online <laughs> right. uh, as part of that reservation process? Well, I've, I've, I've been through the Disney Vacation Club experience, so I know how it goes to go in there and just start signing things away. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's great. Well, we have all these vacation stays. Sure, sure. There's your bank account going away from you, but it's all it's all worth it in in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> it's for the children. That's Tom. right. It's always for the children. We know that for the younglings. <laughs> exactly for the initiates, the younglings, the <laughs> padawans to be. So. That's right. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for uh, the Holonet News this week. Tom, once again, I just really want to thank you for coming on. Uh, why don't you go ahead and give folks information on how they can find you and your podcast? Sure. Thanks again, Rob. Thanks for having us on. It's always a, a great time. Uh, you can find us where the Hyperion Adventures podcast. You can find us pretty much everywhere you find podcasts. We have our own website, HyperionAdventuresPodcast.com. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Podcasts. We're also on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We're pretty much everywhere. And if you want to follow us on social media, we have a lot of fun talking Star Wars, talking Disney, talking Marvel, all sorts of stuff. Uh, You can find us on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram. And we now joined you, Rob, in Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. That's right. And, uh, you know, we have our new our new motto. Thanks to Michelle. Uh, You know, we're the podcast for people who don't want to be a jerk. The the podcast that doesn't make you feel like a jerk. Uh, That's right. (laughs) So let's let's hope that actually is true. But um, yeah. And for you who want to reach out to us, I would certainly love to hear if any of our listening audience has any thoughts on what they think the uh, Star Wars Hotel at Walt Disney World is going to have in store for us. If you've got any uh, ideas or theories about that, go ahead and shoot them off to us. You can reach us at JTA Podcast at gmail.com and also on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram at JTA Podcast. So, uh, you know, if you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review. Uh, mention us to a friend. Spread, you know, spread this podcast through word of mouth is probably the best way to grow our listenership. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any ideas for future shows or topics you'd like to have discussed, or any feedback on how we can improve this podcast, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening, and may the Force be with you. 